indeed. Again, hello uh, and good evening. My name is Sandia Bayou. I'm a Chief Development Officer here at the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston. Welcome to our tonight's program, Governing Global Health with Chelsea Clinton. We want to thank you for joining us this evening as Houston's premier organization providing global education to over hundreds to thousand members, friends, students every year. I'd like to mention some of our upcoming programs. On May 25th at noon, the importance of NATO for energy security, the resilient trade and the defense of democracy with David Cutter, NATO's Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security and Ambassador Spiros Lambridis, permanent representative of Greece on North Atlantic Council. The dialogue will be moderated with Houston's own John England of Deloitte. And we are back in person, that is, June 17th evening, Secretary Gates on Exercise of Power. This event actually in person at our Energy Bank Tower. Also registration is open to two summer programs, Global Policy Institute, designed for business professionals whose career needs a clear understanding of US foreign policy and international relations. And also still taking registrations and don't miss it for our council's Global Scholars Academy. That is a summer international affairs program designated, designated and designed for middle and high school students. You can find more information for these and all our upcoming programs on our website, wachouston.org. On behalf of the council, a very special thanks to Ambassador Christopher Ashby, council's own ambassador in residence for all his kind assistance in making tonight's dialogue possible. Thank you. Marianne Maldonado, our council CEO, will lead the discussion with Chelsea Clinton. Please keep questions coming and use the Q&A tab at the bottom of our screen. Again, Q&A on the bottom. And to introduce our tonight's guest, please join me in welcoming the President and Chief Executive Officer of Champion X Corporation and current Chairman of the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston, a great friend of ours, and the Council, of course, Mr. Soma Soma Sundaram. Soma, welcome. Thank you, Sandhya. Welcome, everyone. It, it's such a great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce our speaker tonight, Chelsea Clinton. As vice chair of the Clinton Foundation, she works alongside the foundation's leadership and partners to help create economic opportunity, improve public health, and inspire civic engagement and service across the United States and around the world. In addition to her foundation work, Chelsea also teaches at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. She has written several books for young readers, including the New York Times bestsellers, She Persisted, 13 American Women Who Changed the World, and She Persisted Around the World, as well as, well as Start Now. She's also the co-author of the Book of Gutsy Women and Grandma's Gardens with her mom, Hillary Clinton, and Governing Global Health, Who Runs the World and Why, with Baby Shreeder. Chelsea holds a Bachelor of Arts from Stanford, a Master of Public Health from Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health, and a Master of Philosophy and a Doctorate in International Relations from Oxford University. Chelsea, your accomplishments are truly inspiring. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Chelsea. Now, let me turn it over to Marianne. Marianne? Thank you, Soma. And Chelsea, welcome to Houston virtually. Uh, thank you so much, Soma, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, Marianne, thank you for the uh, virtual welcome. Um, I uh, am sad that we can't be together in person. I, goodness, can't believe, I guess, that you'll have an event in person next month, which certainly is a sign of um, 
the progress that we're making, thankfully. Thankfully, thankfully. Well, on behalf of the whole council, well, council, we are thrilled that you could join us. And please, if you have some friends join in your video, that's okay too. Oh, no, um, just yeah. I mean, because it's dinner time here, so you may um, you may hear some small people in the background. So, well, thank I hope you, they're Anna, for understanding their- this like work from home, joint events from home world that we're all still cohabitating in. That. Um, <laughs> Oh, yep. Yeah, now I, that's my, my toddler is commenting on, on dinner. So yes, you just may hear running commentary on how it, everyone is feeling about the salmon, rice, uh, broccoli, and cauliflower that was on tonight's menu. Well, I, I thank you for taking your time, your dinner time, uh, away from a little bit of your, your kids, but uh, we're so thrilled you can join us. And, you know, I've had cats run through my video and, uh, you know, dogs barking in the background. So I think we're all accustomed to this, but uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're so thrilled. And as Soma's mentioned, I, I just want to start the dialogue by uh I was just not aware of your so many accomplishments in global health. And I was so surprised and amazed at all the amazing work that yourself, the foundation um, over the past several years has has done. But I really want to start out. um, So I mentioned you attended Columbia. You now teach there. Uh, You've written several books on global health. Before even any of us heard of COVID, what first sparked your interest in going into public health? Yeah, thank you, Marianne, for that question. So, uh, you know, I I think it was a a few things, uh, but probably kind of the one event that really stands out um, was I was a a little girl. I I was in my father's campaign headquarters when he was running for president in uh, November of 1991. Um, And I was, I think I was stuffing envelopes because that's what you can do when you're a kid and you're one of your parents is running for office, you can like, you know, hand out stickers or American flags or flyers and you can stuff envelopes to help be supportive. Uh, so I was stuffing envelopes and uh, and the nightly news was on and I saw a Magic Johnson talk about being HIV positive and just his courage, his bravery, his refusal to be stigmatized for his HIV status, for his health, had a profound impact on me uh, as a kid. I mean, this was the early 90s. You know, we were still very much in the um, kind of crux of our AIDS crisis here in the United States. And all of a sudden, I just wanted to really learn everything I could about about AIDS, about what was happening um, here in the United States and around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what really... um, propelled this specific interest forward in, in public health, in, in health equity, um, in, in global health, in the institutions that hopefully help steward our public health and our, our global health and protect our, our shared health. And that just never left. So, you know, when I was at Stanford, I, I studied history and a bit of biology, but you know, a lot of kind of things that would relate to public health. And then I went and as you know, you heard in the introduction, got you know, my master's in public health and my doctorate in international relations, kind of with a focus on global public health. And and so it didn't all start kind of in that campaign headquarters, you know, almost 30 years ago, but certainly at least uh, some of some of it did. And I, I don't know if I would be here without that without that moment. Mm. Uh- very inspiring, you know, Magic Johnson sports figures play a big role in kind of uh, giving us a role model. And so that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, You were one of the early advocates sounding the alarm for COVID-19 back in February of last year. Now here we are months and months later as an expert in public health. um, Where do you see us in the US and globally? Where, Where, how are we doing? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, Marianne, I, I do think clearly our, our vaccines and certainly the, uh, the data that we have now on kind of the, the real um, kind of effectiveness of the vaccines to help, you know, prevent severe illness, to help prevent um, kind of death from COVID is just really extraordinary. And we know we have uh, vaccinated, um, you know, huge uh, swaths of our country and yet we're still not where we need to be. And so I would, when you ask how we're doing, I think, 
there's so much to point to to say like, wow, like look what we've been able to marshal you know, as a massive public health effort, the tens of thousands of vaccinators and volunteers who have helped you know, more than 100 million Americans now, now be vaccinated, you know, who are still administering millions of shots every day. You know, I do think it is really important to acknowledge that, to celebrate that. And yet I think we also have to acknowledge that, you know, there are parts of the country where fewer than, you know, 30% of people who are eligible to be vaccinated are vaccinated. I think about my home state of, of Arkansas, where that's true. Um, we, you still have many, many millions of, of children who aren't yet eligible to be vaccinated, even though kind of the, the trials are ongoing. You know, we have millions of Americans who are immunocompromised, who are not able to be vaccinated kind of for other medical reasons. And so all of that says we just have to continue to do, which thankfully now the Biden administration is doing, of really trying to you know, bring vaccines to where people are. You think about kind of more rural areas of whether Texas where you are or New York where I am, or even big cities where yes, like, there are vaccines in local pharmacies, but if you live like many, many, many blocks away, that's still you know, often too far for people. So we know that we have more work to do um, here in, in the United States. But then if we think about the world, um, you know, less than 1% of all vaccinations have been administered in low-income countries. You know, that's just a really shocking um, statistic, I think. You know, I think it's like 0.3 or 0.4% of all, all vaccinations have been administered in low-income countries. Um, and we know that we won't really be safe until we've been able to vaccinate the world. And so while um, certainly, you know, the WHO and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Gavi, the kind of Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative, have all worked incredibly hard to raise funds to be able to buy uh, vaccines, have received donations of, of vaccines from kind of different countries and from vaccine manufacturers themselves. Uh, it's just, it's just not enough. And so, you know, I, among many others, when you ask about like, what do I think we need to do, have have called now for many, many months for um, the sharing of vaccine technology and also for meaningful investment to be able to, in some places, adapt pre-existing manufacturing um, capabilities and in others to build new manufacturing capabilities um, so that we radically scale up the amount of vaccine that we're producing across the globe so that we're really able to vaccinate the globe. Um, so. You know, how do I think we're doing? I think we're doing, um, we've done so much that is is really good and right um, from a public health perspective here in the US, but until we have a global perspective, we're acting globally, we're also not gonna be able to protect our public health locally. Mm. Um, absolutely. Uh, we have done so much and we see so much in the news now about India and there's so many challenges how can we be better organized to face some of these challenges and when it, especially when it comes to health equity making sure that those underserved and hard to reach are included <clears throat> excuse me i'm having terrible allergies um i don't know if it's allergy season in houston but it's just become like ferociously allergy season here in new york so i apologize um if i like cough or sneeze um at any awkward moment or really any moment you know the um the the World Health Organization, you know, had an independent panel under the you know leadership of the former um, Prime Minister of New Zealand Helen Clark and the former uh, Librarian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, um, an independent panel to look at kind of pandemic preparedness and response and how um, how WHO had done uh, over the last you know sixteen months, seventeen months, and. They issued uh, their report last week, and you know, in some ways, it's disheartening because it's so much of what kind of is in this report is also what was in the report, the reports, the many reports, um, you know, one of which I was a co-author of after Ebola, and yet I do think with much more attention being paid today, hopefully these recommendations will really catalyze, um, you know, a, a more robust kind of global public health leadership from, from WHO and, and partners going forward. So you know, there were some specific criticisms around kind of WHO waiting too long to declare a public health emergency of international concern, of kind of waiting too long to support travel restrictions. Um, but there also were some more kind of 
structural recommendations around um, WHO actually, you know, setting up and then supporting, you know, a, a robust global a surveillance system for new disease outbreaks that could become, you know, a, a pandemic if they weren't kind of immediately contained. Um, but to be able to do that and to be able to do the other things in the report um, that the authors recommend around having kind of more epidemiologists and more virologists who are able to quickly, you know, go to an outbreak, uh, to quickly assess what's happening, to quickly recommend kind of what action should be taken. The WHO needs significantly more resources. And, you know, right now, um, the vast majority of the WHO budget uh, is the result of earmarks from major donors, including the United States. And and many of those earmarks are for programs that I support wholeheartedly, you know, including the you know, continued global effort to eradicate polio. Uh, but the challenge with more than 80% of its budget being earmarked and the challenge that the WHO's budget is you know, less than kind of the budget of a major New York City hospital or major Houston hospital, um, is that it just doesn't have enough resources overall or enough flexible resources to be able to invest in um, in preparing for a crisis or then in responding uh, to a crisis. And so I certainly hope that some of the very specific recommendations of the report will be supported by the WHO membership, uh, you know, including the United States. And I hope that the structural recommendations uh, will be supported too, including kind of raising our respective membership dues to give the agency more um, more funding and more flexible funding uh, to provide leadership when we desperately need it, you know, like, like we have over the last you know, year plus the pandemic. Do some of the WHO directives speak to public-private partnerships and how we can better work together to face some of these challenges? You know, it's a really um, good question. So, you know, WHO actually has like pretty strict guidelines for how it engages with um, any organization that isn't a member state. So not only kind of what we may think of when we think of kind of private partnerships, when we might think of, you know, a, a private company um, like Walmart or Coca-Cola, uh, but also when we think of NGOs like Rotary International, which is a major part of efforts to eradicate polio around the globe. Or if we think about, you know, partners in health or doctors without borders, kind of major kind of medical uh, relief efforts um, around the globe. And so WHO does have pretty strict criteria, you know, some of which I think, you know, makes a lot of sense because it clearly uh, preserves the organization as being kind of, uh, one of member states, kind of 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 governments. I think, though, there has been pressure for quite some time for WHO to be able to work um, more more quickly and therefore more effectively with with partners who aren't member states. Um, and I hope that you know that will be something that um, Dr. Tedros, who's the Director General of WHO, you know, continues to pay attention to. It's it's something I know that he personally is quite committed to. Um, but there's been a lot, you know, happening of late um, because I do think we've seen um, how powerful private, uh, public-private partnerships in the private sector can be in helping to advance um, public health goals. I do think, though, now you know we're in this moment where um, we need a specific, you know, sector of of the private sector to really kind of step forward with more partnership than certainly I I feel like they. Um, have been in a posture of doing, which really is the pharmaceutical industry. Um, we very much candidly need um, Pfizer and, and Moderna, especially to uh, to waive some of the patent uh, protections and the underlying kind of intellectual property rights to unlock the sharing kind of of the vaccine recipes. We need them to engage in active kind of knowledge transfer and tech transfer to facilitate um, what I spoke about earlier, which is the the real scale up of uh, vaccine manufacturing around around the globe, um, you know, and, and Pfizer recently said it was going to make twenty six billion dollars on COVID vaccines alone, even if nothing else changes. So, you know, Pfizer took no money from Operation Warp Speed, so no money from the U.S. government's plan. Unlike Moderna, where we, the American taxpayers, funded a hundred percent of that vaccine's development, or Johnson and Johnson, when we probably funded about seventy five percent through. Um, our direct investment in Janssen, the J&J &J subsidiary, and 
and some of the advanced purchase agreements that we establish with um, Johnson and Johnson. Um, but you know, 20, 25, 26 million dollars is a lot of money, and I'm not an expert in kind of what the appropriate margins are for kind of any specific product or kind of the pharma industry writ large, but certainly from a public health perspective, um, we very much want the private sector to continue to be incentivized, to continue to innovate and develop, um, you know, life-saving therapies and treatments and vaccinations. Uh, we also, though, need them to be the public health partners um, that we require right now to be able to vaccinate um, the world. Um, because the longer that we kind of sit back and um, allow COVID to circulate, not only you know, will there continue to be such death and devastation um, that I think is indefensible and we have ways to stop that, uh, but we also then you know, are effectively um, permitting the ongoing development of variants. Um, and you know, in this race, as so many have said, of kind of the vaccines versus the variants, you know, if we're not really like investing in the vaccines, you know, we're effectively ceding ground to the variants. And I think that's a very um, dangerous equation. Um, absolutely. I invite all of our audience to sub continue to submit your questions and we're going to get on to your books and the foundation and maybe a little bit of politics, but I have to ask you the question about misinformation, especially around vaccines and the hesitancy of certain demographics to, um, to proceed in getting the vaccine. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. So there's actually like, you know, I think Two, two separate and, and yet related questions. So there's the, the there's the question about you know, why do we have certain um, segments of you know of our country who haven't been getting vaccinated um, at the rate that others have been? And you know, for I think some people, it's very much still been about access. So you know, certainly if we look at recent data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, we see that uh, Latinos say, you know, they're the most enthusiastic to get vaccinated and yet often have um, the hardest time getting vaccinated. The, they live the furthest from vaccination sites. They may not be able to take time off of work. Um, people may not know that the vaccine is free, uh, that you cannot be charged for the vaccine, uh, whether you're at a, um, a, a private hospital or a public hospital, if you're at a city site or a county site or a federal site, like you cannot be charged for your COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and so I think, you know, when we think about how do we try to vaccinate more people, we still have to acknowledge there are very real access challenges that we have to tackle. And some of those access challenges are information challenges, like ensuring that people know um, where to go, ensuring that employers know it's really in their best interest to provide, you know, paid time off for people to go and get the uh, vaccine to ensure that, you know, people know that it's free, you know, and, and kind of other kind of basic kind of logistics and just kind of facts around, around the vaccine. Um, so I think we don't want to conflate those two because I think there are very real um, access challenges that also have information components that we need, you know, to continue to focus on. And thankfully, um, the Biden administration, but also a lot of um, state and local health authorities are really focused on, you know, trying to, again, continue to bring um, vaccines to where people are and ensure that people have all the information that they, they need to hopefully decide to get themselves vaccinated. And then we have kind of, as you first asked um, in the first part of your question, just so much misinformation and disinformation around vaccines and vaccinations. And I think it's important to recognize that, um, this is not a new challenge in uh, in vaccinations. Um, you know, if we think about you know what then uh, General, future President, but then General, you know George Washington confronted when he decided to inoculate the Continental Army against smallpox through um, a process uh, known as variolation, effectively a, a, a predecessor process to vaccination. Um, there was intense opposition from some people who were very skeptical. Like, what is this thing that General Washington wants to do? Wait, he wants to put like virus into people's bodies. How do we know that's really gonna have the effect that he says it's gonna have? This all just feels like very unnatural. People, you know, even, you know, more than 200 years ago were saying like, well, we should really just, you know, trust in God and, and General Washington like making just the arguments repeatedly saying, well, you know, we may not be able to um, defeat the British if we're defeated by smallpox first. And 
we really believe that you know God enabled us to ask these questions and develop the science to facilitate um, the development of variolation and you know kind of in in different language um, and in a, di a very different historical context, but you know very kind of similar to some of the debates and conversations around uh, vaccines and vaccinations today. But what is very different, um, I think, are, are a few things. One, you know, the, the complete um, kind of fabrication of science, uh, you know, that we've seen most infamously, you know, in kind of the uh, paper that Andrew Wakefield published, you know, more than two decades ago, claiming a link between the MMR vaccine and autism, a paper that was repeatedly discredited that, that the Lancet had to um, take down, apologize for. Um, the British Medical Association stripped Andrew Wakefield of his medical license. So, you know, hard to think of a, a more complete repudiation um, than kind of what we saw in that case. And yet, kind of that um, fabricated science is still treated as, unfortunately, like real science and, and real evidence. And kind of that, that I think is different, kind of those examples. You know, but arguably the biggest difference really is what the internet has enabled. And so, you know, whereas before vaccine um, kind of skepticism and vaccine misinformation, you know, would travel person to person or kind of through through pamphlets from one person to, you know, you know, a few people, you know, now we have vaccine misinformation traveling, you know, from one person to many millions of people. And we know that over the course of the pandemic, you know, some of the biggest uh, purveyors of vaccine misinformation of things that are, you know, I would argue not in the realm of fair questioning, things that are anti-science, often, you know, trafficking in, in conspiracy theories, um, sometimes trafficking in kind of the worst kind of anti-Semitic or Islamophobic conspiracy theories, you know, are able to reach many millions of people, you know, Facebook groups that had, um, you know, tens of thousands of followers pre-pandemic that were kind of anti-vaccine oriented now have had millions of members during COVID. You know, videos on YouTube that would receive, you know, hundreds of views are now receiving hundreds of thousands of views. And I think it's a very serious problem. Um, and it's being recognized as a very serious problem, thankfully, but we're still not doing enough to contain it. And even Facebook, uh, who has repeatedly said that they will take down misinformation and they will take down accounts that persistently um, kind of push misinformation that has been you know, discredited by public health authorities, continues to allow many accounts to, um, to flourish on its platforms, you know, not just on you know, traditional Facebook, but also on Instagram and, and WhatsApp. Um, and so I just think we have to continue to um, call out and name the dangers of misinformation and continue to call out the responsibility of the social media platforms to um, not be facilitating the spread of um, very dangerous misinformation, especially in the midst of a pandemic, and continue to push them to at least live up to their own standards. I mean, you know, Marianne, there have been all sorts of things said about me over my life that are totally not true. Um, but I actually think it's important that um, people be able to say even things that are not true about you know, those who have powerful positions. Um, but I can hold that thought and hold the thought that I actually think it's also important that people not be able to say things you know, in the midst of a pandemic that are just going to continue to endanger um, more people's lives and livelihoods in our shared our shared public health. And I think I think those positions are actually quite consistent. I hear your passion in this. Is that what prompted you to start your podcast, kind of talk more factually? Partly, yeah, partly. And you know, and I I was academically interested in the anti-vaccine movement. Um, and then when I was pregnant with Charlotte, our first, um, I had I had um, a few encounters where people would come up to me and say, you know, I hope you're not going to vaccinate your child. Like, please don't vaccinate your child. Like, please don't endanger your child. And just the, the passion, but the fundamentally um, not rooted in reality kind of passion was so um, troubling to me. And, and 
you know, for people for whom I then would engage in conversation, you know, it would almost always then emerge. It was, you know, they had, they had, they had come to understand how dangerous vaccines were kind of through, through Facebook and things that they'd watched on Facebook or heard on Facebook. And then to see kind of over the course of the pandemic, how many, um, kind of narratives have taken hold that have nothing to do with facts or science. Um, you know, I started my podcast, you know, partly because more people are paying attention to public health than at any other point in my lifetime. And I wanted um, to help people understand that public health isn't something we should just care about during a pandemic. It's something we should hopefully be attentive to and care about all the time and to help people understand how much really does relate to our public health, whether that's you know, climate change or um, firearm injury prevention and gun violence um, prevention, you know, and so much else. And also to try to root all of those conversations, you know, out of politics, candidly, and very much kind of in, in public health and in facts. Um, well, I want to make sure we, we get to as many topics as we can. Uh, you have a uh, brought all of your expertise to the Clinton Foundation and working with the um, Health Access Initiative in over 125 countries battling things like malaria, tuberculosis, hepatitis, cancer. Tell us a little bit about that work that you're working on. So the Clinton Health Access Initiative was started uh, 20 years ago um, by my dad to really help change um, the equation around who had access to HIV treatments because 20 years ago, if you were here in the United States, um, you probably did have access to antiretroviral treatment, maybe through your commercial insurer, maybe through Medicaid, kind of maybe through um, Ryan White funding. And yet if you were not in um, a wealthy country, you probably didn't have access to antiretroviral therapy. We think maybe, you know, at the turn of the millennium, only about 10,000 people is one example, kind of from all of Sub-Saharan Africa had access to, excuse me, antiretroviral treatment, um, which is so important because it really can um, change HIV from a death sentence to a chronic illness um, and enable someone to continue to lead their lives as a, as a person, as a citizen, as a, as a parent, as a student, as a professional. And... So my father you know, started the Clinton Foundation and, and started CHI to really help change that, to help uh, convert the market for AIDS medicines from one that had been a, you know, a high price, low volume one to a high volume, low price one. Um, and, and thankfully, you know, he was able to do that. And then that kind of set up the precedent for you know, the work that, um, that the foundation has just continued to do in, in many different areas. Uh, you mentioned you tuberculosis and malaria, also in, in uh, childhood nutrition, in, in maternal and newborn health. And a big area of focus for, uh, for us over the last few years has been on medical oxygen, which I don't think a lot of people really had thought about until COVID. But we know that you know, not having access to medical oxygen um, is, is another you know, major health inequity across the globe. Um, we know how important access to medical oxygen is to pneumonia patients, as an example, is to um, sometimes mothers who are in labor or to newborns. Um, and the, the lack of access to medical oxygen you know, led to hundreds of thousands of deaths every year, even before COVID. And now we see with COVID, you know, just even more urgency um, to invest in kind of building medical oxygen uh, capa capacity around the world. and building access to medical oxygen um, around the world. And so that's work that we've been focused on over the last few years, and it um, just has become so painfully uh, relevant and more urgent over the last year. Um, this pandemic has exacerbated the inequities across healthcare and especially the toll on our children when it comes to early brain um, development, language, social emotional development. Um, and I know the Clinton Foundation works to support families and parents. What are you doing to make sure every kid succeeds or has the opportunity to exceed, succeed? So, so Marion, our work at the foundation is really focused on, um, on, on young kids. So kind of zero to five-year-olds and, and their parents and, um, and grandparents and you know, other adults in their lives who care for them. And so, you know, we very much are focused on early brain development and 
So that means you know, trying to help uh, you know, parents understand that we are our children's first teachers and to encourage parents to read, sing, and talk to their kids because we know that our you know, brains are being built you know, from the moment that we're born and that 80% of our brains are built by the time we're three. Um, also to encourage early um, numeracy and math skills and also to really you know, build um, strong social emotional skills uh, in children and to help parents feel comfortable in, in being able able to do that because we know that you know kids who do have you know even one trusted adult in their lives who do very much feel like they have a safe place to um, to go to to return to are so much more likely to um, to be healthy and to thrive later in life. You know, you mentioned the the pandemic. You know, pediatricians and public health authorities have now you know, classified the pandemic as an adverse childhood experience or an ACE, which means that it's a, a trauma. And I think it's important to recognize that the trauma has not fallen equally on all children. Certainly, for children who have lost a parent or a grandparent to COVID, or whose parents may have lost their job and now they're confronting hunger and homelessness. Uh, so certainly, the pandemic has fallen. Um, hardest on already our kids who were um, more vulnerable. And yet we know that it has affected every child. Um, and so I think you know, we will all have work to do. And we're talking today on um, Mental Health Awareness Day. You know, we all will have work to do. You know, certainly us, the foundation, and then thinking about just me as a parent to ensure that we're continuing to support our children um, as they continue to uh, grapple with the effects of the pandemic. And some of those will be you know, things they'll grapple with over the next um, months, and some may be things they'll grapple with over the next many years. I think this is a good segue to your uh, She Persisted series. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, we, uh, I know a little bit that you are looking at um, strong, resilient women who've really met and faced and overcome some significant challenges. What gave you the desire to do that? So I wrote the first She Persisted book, um, goodness, like more than four years ago. It came out in May, four years ago. And you know, the first book very much um, emerged from sort of two things coming together. Um, one was the now you know, infamous moment when Senator Elizabeth Warren uh, tried to read a letter that uh, Coretta Scott King had written more than 30 years before about uh, Jeff Sessions. And, um, and the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, didn't think that um, she should read the letter. And I certainly think it's always a good time to hear from the great Mrs. King, who I think too often is framed as kind of just being um, Dr. King's uh, wife and then widow, but very much was a civil rights leader in her own right, even before she met her husband. And then very much after she met her husband as well. And so I think it's always a good time uh, to hear from Mrs. King and from Senator Warren. And unfortunately, um, as I'm sure all of you, you remember, uh, Mitch McConnell did not agree with that. And uh, Senator Warren kept trying to read Mrs. King's letter and Mitch McConnell kept telling her to be quiet. And then he formally censured her, which means he really did effectively silence her. And then afterwards, when he was speaking to reporters, he um, sort of cast himself as the victim of this moment, right? That he kept telling her she couldn't do this. And, you know, she had the temerity to keep trying and he kept telling her and she kept trying and he kept telling her and you know, yet nevertheless, she persisted. And um, I, I watched all of this in real time because I was uh, breastfeeding my uh, middle son. Uh, well, he was my young son at the moment, but now he's my middle son. And, um, it was just so painful to see this happen. Um, painful to me as uh, I'm an American and as a mom and as a mom of a daughter and a son. Um, and also at the time I'd really been uh, looking for children's books that were uh, centered on women, um, centered on women's voices, kind of told from the perspective of women and girls because uh, the majority, and this is still true um, every year, unfortunately, and we're making progress, but it's still true. The majority of children's books kind of, that have been written and the majority of children's books that are written every year uh, are still told from a, a male perspective and are still centered on male voices. Um, and so kind of these two things came together in my head and I was like, oh, like I should, I should write a kid's book that I would want to read to my kids, to my daughter and my son. And um, 
wow, like so often the history of our country has been the history of women persisting to help move us forward, whether we're thinking about politics or the arts or athletics, um, media and so much else, science, health. And so I just thought about women that had really inspired me um, and the stories I wanted to share with young readers. And and then um, I, I wrote the book and it actually uh, took a surprisingly long time uh, because it's very hard to distill down these amazing women's stories into the two or three sentences that you're kind of allowed to have in a picture book. Um, but I'm so thankful that it did so well. And then kind of, I had the chance to write other She Persisted uh, picture books. And now um, the first picture book has been turned into a series of chapter books that are coming out this year or that have, have been coming out and will continue to come out this year, um, which is particularly fun, Marianne, because there were, you know, littler kids who read the chapter book who now are old enough, i sorry, who read the picture book who now are old enough to read the chapter books. I have to ask the question, will your mom be a part of any of those? So she's in the opening gallery spread. Um, I didn't, um, I didn't want the book to you know, be about my mom. And yet I couldn't write a book about women who'd inspired me without including her in some way. So uh, I worked with the just amazingly talented Alexandra Boyinger, who is the illustrator of the She Persisted series and someone I'm so thankful to have had the chance to work with. Um, and so uh, Coretta Scott King's like bust is, because I also didn't want it to just be about the the, the political moment um, that we were in uh, then. So, but Coretta Scott King's bust is there. Um, in the in the gallery spread and, and my mom's um, pictures on the wall. Uh, who might we see coming up? Who inspires you, I guess, is the better question. So I, um, I wrote a, a book, um, She Persisted Around the World, about uh, some women who've inspired me around the world, some of whom I had known of before and some of whom I learned in the process of writing um, the book. And uh, then I wrote a book about she persisted in sports because I have always loved sports. And as you were mentioning kind of earlier, I've always really drawn um, inspiration from sports figures, even though I've never had a lot of talent um, on a field or a court or in a pool um, or on a rink or really kind of anywhere. Um, and, and we have more chapter books that I don't think we've announced yet. So I don't think I can quite talk about those, but more chapter books coming, some of whom are about some of which are about um, women in the series that have already come out, and some of them are about kind of future chapter or future picture books that haven't come out yet. So, kind of lots of moving pieces, but um, just incredibly excited to continue to share all these stories. Well, I have three little grand girls, and I'm going to make sure that they get copies of these. So, I look forward to the ones yeah. in the past and the ones coming up. We have a question from the audience, which takes us back to our previous topic, but I think we can weave it in. Um, it's from Lauren. She mentioned um, the challenge for the WHO with its relatively small budget, considering its global mandate. Um, but it is also a challenge for the WHO that it is dependent upon funding from some of the same countries in may ha it, uh, it may have uh, to objectively in investigate after an outbreak of virus. I think she's talking about China. You know, so this is a tension that exists not only at WHO, but uh, really in every um, international multilateral organization where um, kind of member states are uh, at least in theory, kind of ceding some um, some authority uh, to the global organizations because of the um, kind of the belief and the expectation that in return there will be um, kind of lower uh, information um, kind of sharing costs that information will be shared more readily and more widely, more consistently. Um, that there will be kind of expertise that will be kind of facilitated and enabled kind of by having many different experts from many different countries kind of work collaborative, collaboratively, excuse me, toward a shared mission than would be possible if kind of each were kind of only working, you know, in their, in their home countries. 
Um, but certainly I think, you know, the, the question is, is a very good one. Um, you know, and really, I think the question is, is not just about the WHO, it's about kind of multilateral organizations um, holistically, you know, will they be able to really perform the functions that they are, you know, invested uh, with, at least kind of in theory and hope kind of ostensibly, you know, when, when countries um, may make a different calculation, may decide that it actually isn't in their best interest to be kind of fully transparent, to be kind of fully open, to kind of share information um, expeditiously, to open themselves up to um, expeditious um, kind of surveillance and kind of disease um, investigation and inquiry. So, you know, I, I would hope um, that uh, we could get to a place where um, WHO would kind of have the, the trust and the confidence of the world, um, because I think, you know, for others who said, oh, well, we need a new organization. Um, we still need all the functions that uh, WHO has. Um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to uh, kind of recreate those, those functions kind of under a different um, aegis. I think we do need to though reform the organization and, um, and I don't think we can reform it without as the questioner acknowledged and as I spoke about earlier, you know, investing it with significantly more resources but also kind of more authority to do the type of work the questioner um, was asking about. But for it to actually then be able to do it, the countries have to believe that it is in their best interest to have kind of open and honest um, kind of dialogue and uh, the sharing of, of data and, um, and enabling, you know, WHO in the same way that like the IAEA does kind of on, on nuclear inspections kind of have that, have that same level of, of cooperation when it comes to, to outbreaks, especially when they um, involve a novel pathogen. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a real existential question um, for the WHO and, and really for multilateral organizations writ large. Um, but I continue to believe that we do need a WHO. So we just have to continue to make the case, you know, not only to China, but also kind of lead to the United States and to other countries um, that this is in our shared interest. Um, and then to invest the organization with the resources needed to actually then be able to do that work. Um, thank you for answering that. Um, so kind of taking our conversation to a global perspective, um, many have perceived the U.S. has kind of stepped back from the leadership role that we once had globally. What would you say is the best way for the U.S. to resume some of that leadership role that we once had? Well, I think the best way for us to um, assume that leadership role is to vaccinate the world. Uh, and we're not doing that. I mean, I, I think that while it's uh, very good that President Biden has committed to donating now 70 million doses by uh, July 4th, um, it's, it's May, right? It's, it's May 20th, like we should be doing it now. And yet we know we can't donate our way out of this challenge. Um, we do not have sufficient excess doses to donate our way out of this challenge. And that's not to say that we shouldn't donate the doses that we do have that we're not using, especially for those that are, um, you know, the AstraZeneca doses that aren't even you know, yet approved here in the US but have been approved by other regulatory agencies around the world. Um, but that's still not sufficient. We need to be um, supporting the South African and Indian uh, proposal in front of WTO to um, kind of waive the uh, vaccine patents, uh, we need to engage in robust kind of knowledge and tech transfer. And then we also need to um, you know, invest in, in adapting and building manufacturing uh, capabilities. You know, um, Oxfam and, and Prep for All and kind of the, the People's Vaccine, which I've been a big supporter of, you know, all, all estimate that investing in building kind of you know, flexible vaccine manufacturing capabilities, you know, strategically, you know, across the globe, you know, would require, you know, 24, $25 billion. And I know that sounds like a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of kind of the federal budget, it's, it's not, and it would be, you know, money incredibly well invested for our shared global public health, but also, you know, for our, uh, our economy, our national security, and directly to the kind of point of the question, um, 
helping to recover our stature on the world and and lead again um, in a in a very kind of profound and, and urgent way. We have a question from Rick. He asks, how can we help more Americans understand that besides COVID, many other current and future global health issues can impact the US? Well, I, I think we can all do that in our own way by um, you know, talking to people um, in our families and our communities you know, about, um, about public health and about uh, even about COVID and just saying, you know, maybe you didn't think about public health, you know, a year and a half ago, maybe you didn't think about, um, you know, pandemics a year and a half ago. You know, we can't think that um, this won't happen again because it might. Um, and then also to use kind of those conversations about infectious diseases to help people, you know, understand how much else really relates to public health. You know, why, as you all know um, really well in your part of the world, like why the growing frequency of extreme weather events are public health issues. Um, you know, why, regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum, you know, gun violence prevention is a public health issue. You know, anything else that was killing more than 44,000 Americans a year would be a public health issue. Um, and, you know, so much else that, you know, we could, we could discuss and, you know, and I hope that you will discuss um, you know, with your with your friends and with your family. And then I think, you know, wherever we may be, to to push our schools to uh, really uh, teach kids at age appropriate levels, you know, about public health, so that kind of future generations um, grow up um, just being more aware and attentive to how interconnected all of our health really is. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question. Um, Will you ever consider following your parents' example and pursuing a political career? No, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any plans to. I think it's important that anyone who cares about our country and our communities, you know, thinks about running for public office. So it's certainly something I've thought about, but it's it's not the way that I feel called to serve right now or engage in the world. Um, and I also, you know, thankfully feel really well represented from my um, my city council woman. Her, her name is Carlina Rivera. Mm -hmm. here in New York City. I think she's great. Like all the way, you know, through to thankfully who's who's sitting in the White House with uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris. There's so many excellent opportunities to get involved outside of running for office. And I think totally. you're doing so totally. much in that yeah. regard. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you've grown up having strong role models, um, especially female role models. What legacy do you want to leave for your children? Oh, I, I want them to... Um, feel that I made the world a better place for them, um, that kind of all of my energies hopefully had some positive effect. Um, but most importantly, um, I, I want them to think I was the best mom that I could be for them. I mean, that's what I care most about in life is, is being their mom and being the best mom that I can be for them every day. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, it inspires us all to, to you know, take stock in what we have, um, especially at this time experiencing the last year we've all experienced. It's been um, challenging and um, disruptive. And yet, you know, some of the very core values have been really enhanced, I think, through this time about your, your love of family, your love of community, your, your love of your coworkers even. And so uh, we, I am just so thrilled, Chelsea, that you could join us today. Tell us a little bit more about how we can get involved in your podcast. Oh gosh, well, please, I hope you'll take a listen. Um, you can find it through the iHeartRadio app or uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, goodness, I should know this, Marianne. I think we've had five episodes so far, maybe six, but I think it's <laughs> five or six. Um, and, you know, on upcoming episodes, we will talk about you know, something we talked about earlier today, you know, kids' mental health and how we support the kids in our lives, um, especially coming out of the, the pandemic. Um, and, and so much else. So yes, I hope you'll take a listen and I hope you enjoy it. Chelsea, it's been my honor to have you with the World Affairs Council of Houston tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and your family. And I hope you can come down to Houston in person one day soon. So do I. Uh, Marianne, <laughs> thank you so much for having me and, and thank you to everyone at the council. Thank you. Uh, to all our members and our guests, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Marianne Maldonado, and we look forward to having you next time for our global perspectives and local conversations. Good night. <laughs>